the responsibility lies with the architect to be able to communicate continuously, repetitively and clearly what the value is of the CA process. Hello and welcome back Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears and today I'm joined by Business of Architecture co-founder Ryan Willard. Ryan, welcome. Thank you very much Enix. Always a pleasure. All right. So today we're going to be having a conversation about handling contract administration. Some people call it construction observation, but we're going to talk about some of the challenges that you may be facing as an architectural practice owner or an architectural professional when dealing with clients who, number one, they, maybe they don't want to pay for contract admin. Maybe it comes as a surprise to them. Maybe it starts, they start to see it as a burden. And we're going to talk through some different strategies for helping you as an architect ensure that you have the best project outcome by being able to persuade, or as we said in the title of this podcast, convince our, um, your clients about the value of contract administration. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the world's leading step-by-step -step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. Now, we use the word convince and, and persuade, but these are probably not the right words because convincing generally describes like we're trying to sell someone something, we're trying to like convince them of something that they're not already on board with. Uh, we're going to make a slight distinction around that, but first of all, let's just jump into some of the problems that architects face when it comes to contract administration. First, what it is, just quickly for those who aren't architects, contract administration, your documents are a set of legal documents. Architects provide the service of being able to ensure that the buildings that are built off of those documents match up with the drawings, because this is a problem with construction. Let's say that you hire some architects, they have these, they have these draw, beautiful drawings done. They're they're very they're very well detailed. They're very good drawings, and then the contractor just swaps everything out. Doesn't follow the instructions. Uh, it's going to lead to poor building quality. It's going to lead to perhaps uh, materials and things that don't last as long. It can even cause structural problems and issues with waterproofing or structural damage to the building. So it can be a major huge problem. So architects serve as a partner with the contractor to oversee the building project to help make sure that these things that that it is that is actually built the way that it was designed. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things is, as well with the CA process and some of the problems that we see um, architects facing is ultimately clients don't understand or see the value in CA, nor do clients understand what the drawing set is. So they don't necessarily understand that the drawing set is like a set of instructions that's been given to a builder and that there is also a bit of wriggle room in these instructions. Now the architect does their utmost best to ensure that every base is covered but there is also an element of interpreting those drawings and there may be pieces that have been flagged up or things that need to be resolved on site. Certainly when you're working on buildings that are of a historic nature um you know you, you it, it's not uncommon for a set of contract documents to have an approach which is outlined which can only be determined once certain things have been done on site and that kind of just adds another level of 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 complexity uh to to the process but ultimately the client is not always aware of well that these are a set of instructions and they need they need some guidance or somebody to help the builder really make sure that they are doing the right thing because we all know that you can have the best set of drawings in the world the builder still has to look at them the builder still Absolutely. has to yep. Yep. interpret them and i'm sure many of many of the people listening to the episode you've probably had the experience of going to a job site 
and you're asking the plumber, well, hey, it shows this on the drawing. Where's the drawing? And the plumber's like, oh, the drawing? I'm not quite sure. And then he goes to the main job trailer, and there it is, crumpled underneath the, uh, sitting there underneath the desk, and didn't even look at it. You know, they're not, they're not using the drawing. So that's that's pretty. It's not uncommon that tradespeople, as excellent as they are, because let's face it, the world runs on the trades. Uh, we don't want to knock their expertise or anything, but oftentimes they may or may not, especially if they're not supervisors, they may or not, not have the ability to look at a plan and really read it. Typically what they might do is they just know how they've done it in the past. They're going to go in there, they're going to do it. And it might not line up with the design intent. And the reason why that actually matters for clients is because architects take very great care to make sure that things are designed in an adequate way that considers both aesthetics, that considers safety, that considers the budget of the project. And when something as simple as like a toilet gets installed a little bit over, a little bit wrong, or maybe a different fixture, it can impact a lot of other things in the project. So for instance, we just this topic came up because Ryan and I in the Smart Practice Program, we were talking with one of our clients who is bemoaning the, the, the frustration that oftentimes uh, you can have with clients when uh, in this case they went with uh, a low bid contractor and typically low bid contractors not all the time but typically you're you're going to potentially run into greater problems in the build phase of the project because they're trying to save money maybe they underbid it etc in this case this was a typical scenario where the contractor was a family friend who had done residential architecture in the past. So of course the client thinks, oh, it's, it's an interior build out. They're using metal studs, no big deal. It's just metal studs. And so he brings in a residential contractor to build out this, this, this uh, commercial space against the better judgment recommendation of the architect. They went ahead this anyway. So now when the architect's team is going out there to the site and looking at the, at the, the inter finish out that's going up, things are not to code. So for instance, uh, architect shows up and he noticed that, um, well, he gets a call because the inspector, the inspector actually catches this, says, hey, the uh, the light fixtures aren't installed correctly, so you're going to have to remove these. So architect gets down there, finds out not only were the were lights not installed correctly, they were actually not even the lights that were specified. So now the, the contractor is in charge of having to remove these out, but now he's arguing with the, his owner who's related to saying, oh, yeah, it's much easier. Let's just do these lights. It's going to be better, and this thing blows up. And, of course, the architect is super frustrated because now he's getting pulled into it. He's getting blamed. You know, the contractor saying, oh, well, you know, there it wasn't clear on the drawings or this is a better way to do it, et cetera, and this is not a pretty situation. So these are the kind of, from the architect side, these are the kind of frustrations that happen when, you show up to the job site, and now people are arguing with you. They're arguing for a lesser solution instead of just implementing what the contractor already bid out, what was in the contract documents, what was already agreed upon. It's sort of like you go to a restaurant and you order this nice meal, and they come out, and it's it's a different, it's just a different dish, and you're like, that's not what I ordered. And the waiter's like, well, sir, this is this is very very good. I mean, actually, it's even some people would argue it's better quality than the one that you ordered. I mean, this is, and plus it's half the price. Don't you want this meal, sir? You're like, bloody hell, I don't want that meal. Give me what I ordered. <laughs> so the architect in a contract administration situation is the one who makes sure that the meal you ordered is the meal you're going to get. And there's a million reasons for that. But a part of the problem, again, as Ryan was mentioning, that, that can happen on job sites is that it becomes a contentious issue because the contractors are deviating from the plans and then now the contractors are trying to convince the owners that these deviations are necessary because it's going to cost the contractor more money to go back and fix what they did or maybe the, if they did it according to the plan it's going to cost them money because they underbid the job or they're trying to save some money and now the architect gets put in the bad position gets gets kind of in the bad seat what's like hey am i'm the architect am i the only person here who's like advocating to put in high quality materials to keep this thing at a very high level, like we designed it and like it was priced out as. I, I think it's so interesting this part of the of the architectural process of um, how these deviations can happen and how unaware clients are of the the problems that can that can occur, and also the kind of politics, the kind of construction politics that can happen, where the GC can you know end up teaming up with the client and make the architect look bad or the architect becomes the the one who's the point of blame it's easy to kind of lean into 
um, these sorts of myths about the architect that well they've over designed this they've made it overly complicated and you don't need to be doing this and and before you know it you've got a situation where the owner is now resenting the architect and the architect is every time they put in a, an hourly bill for the CA work the client looks at it and goes well why did you spend an hour doing this and why did you spend three hours doing that I'm not paying for that that's ridiculous why are there why are there these mistakes in your drawings in the first place this this um this shouldn't have happened this is all this is all of your fault and it can be very really unpleasant and un, and stressful and the majority of stress that we hear from architects comes in two places one is either planning approvals and the other is on site um when they're when we're when they're doing uh, contract administration and with all of this stress that comes with it you know worst case scenario is that the ca now becomes hugely unprofitable for the architect as a as a business and it just becomes a time suck and it's highly complicated and you know uh, architects are uh, being taken out of the office being pulled onto site there's the kind of continued stress that's happening um with it and this can be asymmetric in its disruption and what i mean by that is that you can have a problem on on site and where you haven't been you haven't been involved in ca for example then you get pulled in when it's too late and then for you to try and deal with it is now going to cause so much disruption to your current workflow and you know other projects that you've got commitments on um and then you've got to wrestle for the for the fees to for it as well that the disruption that it causes is asymmetric to the input that is required to resolve it in many cases so it's a very problematic stage of work if not handled with care and skill and i don't mean architectural care and skill i mean communication and salesmanship skill but it's a it's a you know we we see this a lot in our clients um how problematic ca and how much frustration it can cause of people now on the flip side here let's talk about what the possibility could be so let's imagine that the possibility could be that a great project outcomes are ensured that you and your firm you have a process to avoid the problems that we just talked about looking bad in front of the owner because the contractor is now pointing fingers having the owner see you suddenly as a huge expense at the end when you're just there to ensure great project outcomes imagine that instead it was possible to have clients who are ecstatic that you were their advocate that they see the value of sticking to the original design or modifying where appropriate with the original design intent in mind Imagine that instead of having the trust diminish between the architectural and building team, imagine the trust is actually built and that you as an architectural team become uh, even more even more trusted as consultants and advisors. And even instead of taking a less, loss on the project, that it actually becomes a bit of a profit center. So imagine that were possible. Now, quickly going to break in here, uh, just a quick note about smart practice. For those of you who run small architectural practices, Solving these problems that we're talking about today in terms of contract admin is something that we cover that is covered in the smart practice method. So if you're looking for a way to help run your practice in a way such that the business doesn't get in the way of the architecture, in a way that you can bring your calling and your design ethos to the world in a powerful way so that money doesn't hold you back, that's what smart practice method is all about. And we'd like to invite you to head over to smartpracticemethod.com for a free 60-minute firm owner masterclass about the systems and processes that you need in your practice to be able to have your freedom and fulfillment as an architect. Welcome back. We're going to continue our conversation about contract administration. We talked about the problems, the possibility. Ryan, let's talk about some of the principles that are at play here to make this shift in the client's mind from seeing architects as burdens, from seeing architects as, as, as cost centers, to actually seeing them as valuable team members who are an investment, meaning that they're actually making you money. I think that the first principle here is that it's your role as the architect, it's your role and responsibility to have the client see the value of the CA process. Okay, because otherwise, they it it doesn't make sense. Okay, even for, even for a sophisticated client, you know, or an experienced client, and we hope that experienced and sophisticated clients will, you know, their better judgment uh, will will inform them that having the architect on site is really really valuable. But even for those types of clients, because the role of CA is very much preventative, you know, clients can become complacent 
because they're not aware and you as the architect hasn't made them aware of all of the bullshit that they've just avoided. They don't know. They're just like, okay, fine, great. And they can forget. Okay, so they, they might not be, you know, they actually, the fact that you've done your job really well in CA with the same client for a long period of, of, of time, um, they can become complacent or forget why it is that you're doing that role in the first place. And if they start having some kind of um, shift with their finances or they're trying to cut corners or something like that because of some uh, a financial target that they've suddenly become, uh, that, they're, that, they're, that they're pursuing, they might end up thinking, well, well but we don't need this. We don't need this service anymore from the architect, you know, not realizing or forgetting how key to keeping the projects move smoothly um, it, it is. So ultimately, the, the responsibility lies with the architect to be able to communicate continuously, repetitively and clearly what the value is of the CA process. When we dig in to speaking with architects with, about their complaints around the CA process, we'll often ask, okay, so what did it look like when, when you explained the value of the CA process to the client? How did that conversation go? We didn't have that conversation. Ah, Okay, so there hasn't been any there hasn't been any explanation of what it is. So how are they expected to to know what the value is? And it's complex as well. It's a it is a complex um part of the of the process and from a client's perspective they might just assume, well surely you've done your job now, you've you've drawn everything out and all the builder's got to do is follow the instructions and and you know, you shouldn't have made any mistakes. But we know that that's not how it works. No client is gonna. No client is going to. Well, very, very. Here's the thing. Clients typically, we can't expect them to always take the long-term view of value in a project. In other words, that's why they hire the architect because they they may approach the project with some some mindsets about how they think things work. Well, you're the professional, and so this is where. So one of the principles here is that you, as an architect, should adopt the mindset of a consultant, not just an architect. So, you know, even engineers, they call them consulting engineers. You know, you, you could be consulting architect. What that means is that you're not just an order taker. You actually put input into the design solution. So, for example, was talking with a residential architect uh, this past week, and he was saying that he's frustrated doing the kind of projects he's doing because oftentimes people come to him. They want a set of plans. They kind of already know what they want, quote, unquote. They bring to him a floor plan. They say, we want something like this. Or maybe they've done some sketches. Can you modify it like this? And so he does them, but then he feels resentful because he's like, oh, man, I could do this better if I just did it from scratch and took into to count the customized, you know, the the customizations that I could do with the space based upon the client, based upon how they live, et cetera, right? But instead of actually powerfully leading his clients, he just kind of does does it their way, right? So there's this fine balance. And then we have on the far other side, we have architects who are known as, uh, you know, these egotistical bastards that uh, everyone resents because they show up and it has to be their way. And it's just this way, just because it's my way and it costs a lot of money. And uh, I'm going to go cut down everyone on the job site. So there's this happy medium between these two, right? Being an order taker. And then over here being this, you know, having your ego on supercharged, there's this middle path of being able to, you know, understand and look at what the client wants and then being able to lead and guide them as a consultant would and help them understand like, hey, that's actually, there's actually a better solution here. And may, may I explain to you why? Let's look at it this way. Oh, and so this is part of the conversation process of, and this is where at the beginning of this episode, I talked about the word convince. What we're not doing here is we're not trying to convince the client that this is the right way. We prefer the word enroll which means that we're presenting a possibility of an idea. We're kind of showing them there's greener pastures over here. Doesn't it look really nice over here? Come with me. It's, it's sort of that that kind of advisor, that mentor mentality. It's like, well, I like your idea. That's a good idea. I'm glad you put some time on that. There's a couple things that you might want to consider. Come over here and take a look at this, right? And so if you when we approach it with the attitude of a consultant, this is where a lot of the added value comes because let's face it, Actually, most clients, when they go to their architect, that's what they want their architect to do. They don't want their architect just to say yes to everything. Like any anyone that I hire to come to my house to fix something or to do my yard, I don't I don't just want to be, hey, do it this way. 
You know, I may have ideas about the end result that I want, but I want them to tell me the best way to do it. I want them to tell me, oh, you know what? If you want your yard to look like that, then it's better that we cut these off right here, right now. It'll look bad for a season, but next year they're going to look fantastic. Wow, I'm glad you told me that. Let's do it that way. It's different than what I was thinking, but I trust you. The, you're the expert and you're the professional. So as Ryan said, it's our responsibility, it's our role to be able to take the mindset of what our clients are actually thinking about their project, their their assumptions. In the case of the, the, the example we gave earlier, where this client was saying, yeah, I'm going to bring in this residential contractor to do commercial work. Like this is where, as an architect, you need to be able to make, give a, make a stand, to take a stand, and then be powerful in your communication to help clients understand what's in their best interest without feeling being egotistical or just being that architect who's always exploding. And this is why Ryan says that it's a sales process, right? It's a process of persuasion. It's a process of education. It's a process of enrollment. And one of the things that you'll need to educate your clients on, see, as Ryan said, clients, you know, generally, unless they're experienced in, in architect AEC, typically um, even experienced professionals don't really understand the idea about when I, I say like other professionals, like maybe construction workers, contractors, things like that, definitely a lot of owners don't really understand that architectural drawings can only get so detailed. The more detail we add, the more it costs to produce the drawings, right? Because the more coordination there is, the more time your staff is spent doing them. And so there's the amount of diminishing returns. So as architects professionals, we know that that, that contract documents show the design intent. If you went to a court of law, they would just say, hey, does this match up with the design intent? So there's this, and this is where it gets subjective. This is where it gets, as Ryan said, there's an element of looseness that's intentional because if we tried to make everything exact, like a NASA spaceship, then the cost would skyrocket even more than it already does. So clients need to understand that this, this idea behind design documents is that there's actually this, this wiggle room that's left in the design documents is actually a good thing. It's saving them money so that architects don't have to detail everything to the nth degree and make the contract documents really expensive and then also make you know really limit the contractor's hands and what they can do so it's this fine balance and use the professional know the best way to walk that fine balance but your client doesn't so this is another example of a point where you need to help educate your clients and help them understand like when they come back during ca and they say well how come you how come your drawing shows this it's a mistake and they're like well it's not really a mistake what it is is it's the design intent is here and the reason why, but now see, if it's already a problem in, in the contract administration, you're on your back foot, now you're explaining why it was done a certain way instead of being proactive in the conversation, prepping them ahead of time, educating them, hey, let me tell you exactly how contract documents work, right? First of all, these are legal documents or a set of instructions. There's something called design intent. Not everything is dealed out, detailed out to the nth degree. For instance, electrical drawings are highly schematic. Right, we know we connect the switches to the lights, but an electrician, they don't wire it like that. Right? They go and they figure out the best way to wire it. If they're if this is a more complex and sophisticated project, they'll do shop drawings where they'll show where the conduit's gonna be run, etc. If it's a smaller project where they're not gonna do that, the subcontractors out there figuring it out themselves, right? So obviously if the architect took the time to specify where all the wire runs are gonna go, where all the conduits are gonna go, that would take a lot of time. And it might be wrong by the time it got to the job site. <laughs> Ryan's having already like flashbacks. So like, can you imagine? We're already losing enough architects as it is. Can you imagine like how many interns we'd need to like to like actually do all the shop level drawings for architects? So clients need to understand this and to bring this point to a close. You know, it's our job as architects. It's our opportunity as architects to enroll clients in this conversation. So that's why it's important that you have a system in your practice for enrolling clients in not only the way that you do your drawings, but also the problems and challenges they're going to have along the way, prep them, prepare them. These are some of the typical challenges that will happen. And then also enroll them and have an educational you know, part of your system that teaches them, for instance, in, about contract administration. It's going to save so, you So this is really interesting. Everything. And, and one of the, the questions that kind of arises is, is then, well, when when do I educate the client? And I'd actually say that you start educating the client before they're even your client. And that you've got the ability to be able to produce marketing collateral, where you're, you know, you're, you're kind of explaining case study documents, you're 
explaining parts of the, the, the building process. You can record these as videos on YouTube channels, as social media uh, content. You can repeat the same thing. You can document little videos of what you're doing in your office or turn, you know, create micro content, if you like, when you're going on site and just explain a little bit, you know, behind the scenes of what it is that you're actually doing so that clients or prospects who actually come across your content, oh, that's really interesting. I never knew that. That's what an architect does. There's a responsibility that you have just in your marketing, okay, is that the education process of the client starts before they've even become your client. It's going to be so much easier if you've got someone who's been watching your marketing collateral or using your resources then they become your client and then you start like a more formalized education process with them okay so you might be you know during the sales process you're going to be highlighting um, what the CA process is about we have a thing at business of architecture that as soon as you've closed the sale you have an expectations meeting which is where you outline to the client you know what, Mr. Client, you've got a series of responsibilities and roles being the owner of a project. Some of them, you know, they're legal and they're very important for you to understand them. Some of them are to do with your own decision making process and how it's going to impact everything, uh, everything else. Some of them are you need to understand the, the process for what happens when you're on site and how to be preparing for your own funds and developing contingencies. So there's a, a point of education at the very outset in an expectations meeting and then you can very easily structure in these points of education for a client throughout the process okay and you know you, if you're supplementing this with a video education you know you're, you've got your marketing collateral you can point people direct back to them it doesn't take much to get somebody onto uh, a 15 minute call for you to outline here's what's here's what's going to happen i need to explain to you some of the the, the pitfalls and the dangers here of these of of what could happen without having the right um, processes in place it's really you know it's for you it's for you as the architect to design how you're going to communicate and then what the frequency is going to be like throughout the the project and the the more communication of this kind of stuff you know you're going to have to be repetitive with it because for some people they haven't understood it they don't understand it this is the first time they're not architects so that really really is a, a priority to design to design our communication process in a network of education with the client and other professionals do this too so as an example um, what came to mind is my, my wife had reconstructive surgery last year and uh, she had reconstructive surgery because the woman has had six children so, I mean, mm -hmm. if you can imagine what that does to a woman's body, she was like, she was like, I want to get this body fixed up. So she had the surgery, right? And as we were looking at the different plastic surgeons, of course, when you go in for a consult with a plastic surgeon, it's just as important for you as an architect to tell your clients the reason behind why you're doing what you're doing, as well as how you're going to do what you're doing is actually doing what you're doing. So, for instance, she came home from that consult with all sorts of pamphlets and instructions about how the process is, what tools they use, why it's like it, you know, typically how long she can expect for recovery, what are some of the potential complications. Like, there's a lot of education that happens. And just consider that that educational process is just as much a part of the job as actually doing the job. Now, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, professionals in my experience that don't do a great job at this. For instance, I've had difficulty personally with uh, accountants <laughs> who don't do this. So you give them your taxes and you get it back and you have no clue why the heck you're paying that amount of money. You have no clue. Did they get all the exemptions? I have no idea. It's just completely blind. On the other hand, I find that doctors and dentists are usually better. So for instance, when you go in for a dentist consult, even when you're sitting in the chair, a lot of times they'll be like, okay, I'm going to use, if it's the first time, they're going to say, if it's a good dentist, they'll say, okay, I'm going to use this tool. It's going to feel like this. It's not going to hurt that much. There's going to be a sharp prick. You're going to be here for 15 minutes. We'll get you out. You'll be able to drive right afterwards. Not a big deal, right? They're walking you through so you can expect. So it's the same thing that, that we need to understand that we can do for our clients. And once you do it, what ends up happening is you end up circumventing all that frustration that happens during the contract administration where you're now having to defend your position, where you're now being seen as a burden instead of a valuable asset to the project. So the path here is to add an enrollment conversation to your system 
in your architectural practice. And as Ryan mentioned, that should start all the way before you even in the marketing materials, all the way down to your 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 conversion process as you're closing the project and even all the way through the different different parts of the project as well. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's it really, I think, as an exercise to actually just sit down and mark out here are the the points where we're going to have these kinds of conversations and have that as a framework that you kind of lean back into and make sure that the, your your adhering to will just create so much more efficiency in in a project and again as well with something like ca i mean there's no reason why you as an architect can completely turn down a project if the client is not willing to do ca at the end of it and we've got plenty of clients who do that they just will like they're like well if you're not going to if you don't want to do ca it's a non-negotiable with us then we're not a fit for you see you later that's part of our that's part of our quality assurance we don't feel safe engaging on a project where the client doesn't want to do um, the CA process so I think that's you know it's a enrollment process it's a sales process um, and it's massively important and all of this pre-education is what's going to turn CA into a much more efficient process a much much more efficient process again one of the things that's difficult about CA is that without any education I'll often liken CA to being like receiving a parking fine because it's unexpected and you the client didn't know it was going to happen or perhaps they'd agreed to a, a base level and then anything above that level just feels like they're being fined for something and usually if they're being if they're receiving like a larger than expected amount for the CA it's because other stressful things are happening on that project at the moment and so now you as the architect are kind of you know one of 100 other things that are stressful happening to the client and they in many cases it's much easier just to sort of blame the architect or at least not pay the architect because you know forget you I've got something bigger to deal with right now and this should never have happened and you know you're now you're asking for for money um, you know, and they've, if they've got no understanding of what the process is, we're much more likely to have that. Also consider the way that we're billing for CA. So most architects or a lot of architects will bill through an hourly billing method. And just the whole idea of giving somebody an, a list of hours to check is problematic because you're giving, you know, the list in itself has this implicit command of check me, find mistakes. And so a client will look through something, a list they don't understand. Why did you spend an hour over here? Why did you spend two hours doing this? I'm not paying for this. This was your mistake on this. So we're, the way that we're actually billing is creating conflict because it's a document that someone can pick apart and refute. So when we often see clients do very well when they bill um, maybe a monthly charge. So they'll have like a fixed rate of say $5,000 a month for CA services. In some months they do way less than $5,000 worth of work. Other months they might do more than $5,000 work. But over the period of time um, of construction, it evens itself out. And it also, it kind of means there that, you know, if construction is three months longer then there's three months more of CA paid for at that $5,000 rate and that's a that's often a lot more palatable for a client particularly if they've been well enrolled for the process and you've kind of frightened them if you like in a way uh, of the dangers that could happen if they don't use the CA process so one other kind of mechanics of actually selling the CA process that we always advise is using case studies. So actually walking the client through third party anecdotes or stories of, you know, here's what happened to this client when they didn't use CA and here's what it cost them and here's the mistakes that happened. And also here's uh, an example of where a client did use CA and here's how much they, here's how we resolved some issues that they had on site and here's how much money they actually saved and the problems were averted. So super, super important. Use case study material to educate your clients. Start the education before you've even met them.
Absolutely. And we look, it, it may seem like a, overwhelming all the things you have to do to be able to get to the free architect stage. That's why we develop smart practice. We'd love to have a conversation with you to see if smart practice is a fit for you so we can actually help you implement these things in your practice so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you so much, Nick. And that's a wrap. Oh yeah, one more thing. If you haven't already, head on over to iTunes and leave a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the world's leading step-by-step -step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.